What's up you guys, I'm Dan, this is Frugal Not Cheap. CNBC recently put out a video about how much Americans think they need in order to be comfortable. On the thumbnail, they've got the title Living uh, Paycheck to Paycheck. So of course, um, the whole goal of this channel is to help people not live paycheck to paycheck. And being a relatively frugal guy, I thought this would be right up our alley. Alright guys, let's check out this video. Looks like I got the title a little bit wrong. It is, How much money do Americans need to be comfortable? The average American says they need to earn $233,000 a year to be financially comfortable. Well, I would imagine that would be, you know, quite comfortable given that, uh, you know, as we've talked about many times, uh, median wages are much, much lower than that. As we can see here, real median personal income in the U.S. was um, Actually, right around $40,000 for the last few years, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. So if we're making nearly six times that amount, um, <laughs> then I imagine that, yeah, we would uh, feel like we're going to be comfortable. But, but, you know, like I've talked about in all my budgeting and Social Security and all the planning videos, of course, things vary a lot by location. But in 2021, American workers on average made only $75,203 annually. America Oh, that's higher. They must. Oh, they're talking about an average here. Let's take a look at average personal income. OK, so it looks like what they're doing is they're conflating um, personal income and household income because the, the household incomes are in the 70,000s. But that's not so much the case for um, the individual income. 72 percent of Americans said they weren't financially secure given their current finances. Oh, man. So regardless of you know, what kind of criticisms that I might have about sort of frugality and, and all kinds of different ways that we talk about on this channel about improving our position. Um, it's definitely not a good thing that the majority of Americans are not feeling financially secure. That That is absolutely not a good thing. And uh, it'd be great if we could change that. And more than a quarter of Americans said they'll likely never be financially secure. Oof. So, yeah, that's also really bad. Just um, not having any hope that they're ever going to get anywhere. And we're talking about over of a quarter of the people that uh, were surveyed here. So, you know, of course, anytime you see statistics, you always wonder, all right, was this a good survey? You know, is it representative and, and that kind of thing? Um, but anyway, nevertheless, um, not a good statistic. With well over half of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, many are failing to meet some of their modest financial goals. There are Ooh, 61%. Uh, living paycheck to paycheck, that's not good either. That means we don't have any emergency fund. Uh, we really don't have any buffer and we're living right on the edge. And that's unfortunately been, you know, the way that uh, Americans have lived uh, for quite a long time. That's one of the reasons why the system was so precarious back in uh, 2008 and 2009 as well. There are actually millions of people struggling. It's not something that people want to talk about, but if you're in a place where your financial security feels super precarious, you're not alone and it's not your fault. So how did it become so difficult to be financially secure in America? So here's probably where we're going to diverge a little bit. So they're saying it's not um, any individual's fault. And of course, there can be situations where where it's not. And at the same time, I'm, I'm not going to be saying that there aren't things that are sort of wrong in, in the, the broader background and environment. Uh, but at the same time, there are things that we can do, thankfully. So not all hope is lost. So I, I do I do think I'll probably diverge with the video a little bit on how much personal agency we can have and how much is just a result of, of circumstance. So sort of, um, I don't want to say victimhood, but essentially something like that. And what can you do about it? Let's do some budgeting. <laughs> Americans Perfect. working full time earned a median monthly income of about four thousand four hundred dollars during the second quarter of twenty twenty three. Ah, oh, so here now they're using a different figure, right? So this is fifty two thousand eight hundred dollars. So eh, that's kind of shady that they they changed the number from seventy five down to fifty two. Three. The average worker takes home seventy five point two percent of gross wages after taxes and benefits shrinking the take-home pay to about $3,308. And that just isn't enough to cover the cost of living. Hang on, let's take a look at that. That seems pretty steep. Yeah, losing 25% right off the top when you're, when you're earning that seems a bit high. 
So maybe there's some 401k savings that is going on in there. Um, of course, there's healthcare, but the tax rates um, at that level are not that high. We've looked at them before. So I'd say this 25% is a bit aggressive. It probably includes some savings. And if that's the case, we should really be adding them back in. Um, otherwise, it's not really fair. In America today. The cost of health care, that has skyrocketed. True. The cost of attending college has skyrocketed. Absolutely The true. cost of purchasing a home has skyrocketed. Yes. But nowhere has anyone said wage growth is up 15%, right? <laughs> well, United Auto Workers are trying to get them to go up um, pretty significantly uh, during the strike that's going on right now. But yeah, yeah, these costs, uh, as we all know, uh, especially college tuition and health care, have far outpaced wage growth, unfortunately. Not good. Take a look at some of the most essential expenses for Americans. The median monthly rent in the U.S. is $2,029 as of June 2023. That amount already accounts for over 46% of the Americans' median pre-tax income. I think we looked at that recently, and we found something similar. A little bit lower, though, at 1876, uh, but still, still pretty high. And that's probably gone up since this looks like it's from June of 2022. Oh, the rent cafe says 1700 and I have seen some rent start to come down. But most U.S. agencies classify spending more than 30% of one's gross monthly income on rent as being rent burdened. Meanwhile, the median mortgage payment for a 2,400 square foot house was $1,957 per month. However, a common rule of thumb advises spending 28% or less of your pre-tax income on mortgage payments. We talked a lot about these rules in a recent video called Our House is Even Affordable, uh, where I looked at really the, the median American situation, looked at housing costs, and then at the end also we compared that to renting. So check that out if you haven't yet. For the median gross monthly earnings, that translates to just $1,232. As we talk to households and talk to consumers out in the real world, especially those say under 40, housing is the big issue. You know, rent, 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 <laughs> mortgage, mortgage, mortgage. It, it is the biggest concern that people aren't gonna be able to make the next payment. Housing is also the reason why cities have become more difficult to afford. Americans said it would require more than $1 million in net worth to be financially comfortable in places like San Francisco, New York, and Southern California. Yeah, and there it makes sense. I mean, the home prices, a million dollar home in San Francisco or LA, uh, New York is, is not <laughs> what you think of when you think of a million dollar home, say, you know, somewhere in the, in the Midwest or even parts of the South here as well. Um, just to go back a minute, though, they were talking about how uh, rent and the mortgage is really the big thing. And yeah, of course, this is going to be uh, the largest single component of any monthly budget. You can see that in all of the budgets that we put together on this channel. But at the same time, um, we can't just look at that, that one thing and not think about, you know, are we getting too much house or apartment for our budget? Are we stretching too much? And then second, what about all the other spending? Because I've worked with many people on their personal finances, and oftentimes I find that they're spending on, you know, frivolous things. They're spending maybe half as much um, as they are on rent. And so that's really a big contributor towards the, um, the precariousness of their situation. Yes, housing is too expensive, but they're making the problem worse by also uh, stretching themselves too thin in other areas, especially on things that um, are not really necessities. This is why we've seen some migration or mobility around the country where some people say, I'm living in a high cost state like California or New York. We really want to sort of pack up and go to an area that's less expensive. And one of the ironies of that is those places that were cheaper before are now becoming more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I moved from New Hampshire down here to Texas. And when I first moved, um, but the the rents here were much more affordable and then i saw this huge spike over the last couple of years and of course the, that has to do with a lot of people like me who came here seeking that anytime that there's an arbitrage just by taking advantage of that arbitrage what you tend to do is to push that arbitrage window to close in other words if this is cheaper than this what will happen is people will buy that and then sell over here and then as that selling pressure happens here that'll bring prices down and the buying happens over here that'll bring prices up and it'll close that arbitrage window now of course when we're talking about living in different places there are way more factors than just the cost of rent and so you can't think of it as a clean arbitrage that can be closed like that at the end of the day you're still talking about different locations different job markets cultures yada 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 so many different things but still 
we can see that there's been some pressure uh, for prices to, uh, to rise uh, in all the places people are moving to and then to come off in the places where people are moving away from. Americans spend on average $690.75 on food every month. Okay. All right, so I, when it says Americans, I don't know if they're talking about a household. Uh, if it's a household, it seems a little bit more reasonable and probably includes eating out. But, you know, my, my grocery bill is still around, what, um, a little over $200 a month. I used to keep it at around 160 so certainly there's been a lot of inflation. Um, but if that, it was a $700 budget for one person, I would say that that's way too high. According to the latest data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that amount is significantly higher than any of USDA's estimated growth. Yeah, so here they've got more liberal plans at like $450 a month uh, for men and then for women around $400 a month. I'm um, just, you know, of course, uh, men are on average larger and require more calories. So that all makes sense. So these are more reasonable levels. Um, I would say even their, their moderate cost plan is probably higher um, than my spend. And then again, this will vary by location, but, uh, but still, yeah. Grocery bills, including more generous and liberal food plans. Add the out-of-pocket health expenditures that cost you. So, you know, if the survey respondents were doing a whole bunch of DoorDash and, and eating out, then yeah, no surprise, it's, uh, it's high, but that doesn't mean that it can't be cut. <laughs> the average Americans, $96.42 every month, and you get a total expense of $2,816.17. Well, we don't have any um, entertainment or any kind of other stuff that's going on in here. Um, but you can see again that that food number is, uh, is way too big of a share of um, a ratio against the uh, the home expenses for renters and two thousand seven hundred and forty four dollars and seventeen cents for homeowners. All right. So like at around twenty eight hundred dollars, that's looking at thirty three thousand six hundred. This is excluding other essential expenses like transportation, child care and debt payments. Mm, those Many are big. Americans are really struggling with just the increase of costs of living and food and housing. Utility bills have gone up. Car insurance has gone up. Mm -hmm. Homeowners True, insurance has gone up. And how yeah. can they pay for them but also meet other goals that they have to? Budgeting experts advise Americans to spend just 50% of their net income on essentials. 30% on wants and 20% on savings or paying off debt. That should look pretty familiar if you watch Caleb Hammer's channel. He's uh, always talking about, you know, your needs, your wants and your savings. So uh, generally, I think, you know, maybe that rubric makes sense. Um, I like to keep the housing costs at around 25% of take home pay. Um, and then by the time that we get to really everything, <laughs> I like to save <laughs> as much as possible. So be much more aggressive here on the savings versus the wants. Um, and even probably the essentials too, I would keep those a little bit lower at like 40% or something like that. Um, though I haven't really calculated it out. The Federal Reserve has <laughs> implemented 11 interest rate hikes to combat inflation since March 2022. But more than a third of Americans said rising interest rates kept them from financial comfort. Yeah, more so than the, they might even know, the, um, the, the cost of having a mortgage has increased so significantly because of this that um, it's really made buying a home a lot less attractive, a lot less attractive in many markets. Higher interest rates really can stand in the way of affordability for many financial activities or decisions that people want to engage in, and home purchases is sort of at the top of that list. Look at the person who was going to buy a house that was, let's say, $375,000 two years ago. Their monthly payment would have been less than $2,000. Now it's about $3,400. Yeah, exactly what I was talking about there. And it's the same house, right? The only thing that has changed is the interest rate. Purchasing a car is more expensive. It's more expensive to maintain a balance on a credit card with the new offers for a credit card, even for the best qualified individual being at 20 and a half percent. All right, but of course, um, these two are things that I wouldn't advocate. Um, I'd much rather save for a used car and uh, not get into credit card debt, of course. And other people are paying uh, closer to 30. The cost of capital is going up very rapidly. And many of the kind of toeholds we saw for lower income households was because they were having access to credit and to home loans and to other things in a relatively flat economy where they still had a good job market. The 
that's not good. So she's saying that people were able to sort of hang on because they were getting into debt, but getting into more and more debt does not mean that the situation isn't getting worse. So I, I don't think that's a really good way to look at it. More than 40% of Americans blamed insufficient retirement funds or emergency savings as a reason for financial insecurity. For a lot of people just to feel financial subjectively, uh, feel financially better, they need some amount of savings. A lot of financial planners will say three months of your income. That's for many people it's so overwhelming that they can't even begin to think about. Yeah, that, that's a really crazy thing that uh, for, ma for many, many people um, having two months, three months uh, away as an emergency fund is just way more than they can even imagine. Again, many difficult situations out there, but hopefully uh, we can start normalizing and looking at strategies for, for helping people to uh, uh, to make that happen and then not have it be such a, a crazy idea. That it. More than half of Americans today said they didn't have at least three months of emergency expenses saved, including 22% that said they had no emergency savings at all. The reality is if expenses are routinely higher than your income, you are not gonna be able to put away meaningful sums. There are many, many households. Of course not. You're going to be going into debt. Households <laughs> who do the verb of saving. You see money go into their account all the time. It just doesn't stay there because they are routinely hit with a need to grab that little bit of money and use it for some kind of income shock or unexpected expense or even expected expense. Thirty-six percent of Americans said they had more credit card. Yeah, so that's a little bit different. So in all the budgets that I put together. Um, I always encourage building in a lot of those uh, infrequent expenses. So a lot of people don't budget for things that are annual or semi-annual or just infrequent expenses. Um, you can also plan ahead that you're going to need uh, maintenance on your vehicle or, or other kinds of things where you might want to have, uh, I guess, so-called sinking fund or anyway, just some money set aside for, for those things. Hard debt than emergency savings. According to Experian, an average American holds a debt balance of $96,371 which includes several loan products like credit cards, auto loans, and mortgages. More than a quarter of Americans... All right, but those are very different kinds of debt, right? So um, the credit card debt, of course, terrible. It's unsecured debt. There's no, probably no asset. We don't know what they bought. Probably no asset there. Uh, with the car loan, you have a depreciating asset. So, you know, not, not as good, but better than credit cards. And with the home, at least you have the possibility of, um, of some equity. And so you have an asset that does tend to appreciate over time, even though um, on average, just at the rate of inflation. And said debt was what kept them from financial security. The fact that many Americans are living in financial insecurity poses a big risk to the economy as a whole. There's a reason why we measure and monitor uh, very closely things like consumer confidence or consumer sentiment, because what populates those data points are everyday measurements like inflation and the strength of the job market. I think COVID really... Uh, also because consumer spending accounts for uh, the large lion's share of U.S. gross domestic products. So it's really important um, in terms of uh, economic output here in the U.S. And then if people are really kind of on the edge and there's a downturn, then you know that that's going to exacerbate that downturn as well, as we saw in the financial crisis. It really showed us that households, when they don't have a level of stability and security, are actually the primary foundation of whether the economy can be strong or not, because we are so based on consumer spending in this country. Public policy can greatly improve Americans' chances of achieving financial security. So for example, Social Security is the bedrock of most people's financial security and retirement. It's not the only source of their retirement income, but it keeps a lot of older people out of poverty. And we know that Social Security needs some reforms in order to maintain its same level of benefits. And then also anything we can do to make sure that employers are offering any kind of retirement savings opportunities, emergency savings opportunities at work, offering employees the ability to enroll in benefits, whether that's health insurance. Yeah, you know, we talk a lot about what we can do as individuals on this channel, because, of course, that's what we have direct control over. But if there are anything we could do in terms of policies, uh, what we see is that a lot of times uh, people just don't choose what's best for themselves in, in the long run. And that sounds very patronizing. I, I hear it when it comes out. 
But that's also what the data shows, right? People just don't end up saving for retirement. They don't end up getting their emergency fund together. And uh, so there are, are ways that we could change policy so that a lot of this stuff is relatively guaranteed. So, you know, we would just wouldn't even have to think about it and it would happen. So I do think that with um, changes in public policy that we could really make a, make a big difference in this area. Ultimately, the answer here is that solutions have to be arrived at at the macro level as well as the household level. Mm -hmm. And so at some level, we all need to try to own our own financial success by managing our money as well as we can across the range of areas like emergency savings and retirement. Financial advisors say the first step is to have a clear goal. What do you want to achieve personally? What do you want to achieve at work? When do you want to retire? What do you want to do for others? And write that down. But the key to success comes down to budgeting. Yep. Everyone should budget. What we say is it's not what you earn, it's what you keep. Mm -hmm. And so think- Of course, both are important, but we have a more immediate control on uh, how much we keep. And then of course, we can always be working on our earnings as well. Think about and have some transparency of where is your money going? And then make sure the budget that you have aligns with the goals that you wrote down. There are actually millions of people struggling. It's not something that people want to talk about, but if you're in a place where your financial security feels super precarious, you're not alone. And it's not your fault. Many people who have really high incomes and a lot of savings still feel financially anxious. So. Don't feel like this is your fault or something to do with the fact that your income isn't enough. You know, we all have to deal with this in different ways. And the most important thing you can do is just acknowledge that and deal with it and not try to avoid it. Yeah, I don't know about the, the tone there at the ending, but I do agree with um, not avoiding it. That's one thing that I found. And uh, people that struggle with the finances is they have a very avoidant um, sort of not personality, but, but when it comes to finances, they really want to put their heads in the sand. And, and they acknowledge that even. They just say, oh, this is not something I'm good at, throw up their hands and try to ignore it as much as possible. And of course, when you do that, you don't end up making, making any progress. So I love it when people uh, decide to um, basically face the fear and uh, tackle their finances and look at those numbers and make changes and follow through with them over time. And, and again, you know, there's a lot we can do as individuals. Um, there's a lot we could do as a society as well. But in the end, in, in most situations, it's not a lost cause. Um, so there's hope, and um, let's keep trying to build the future we want to have. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.